relates to this topic, questions you have or experience you have gardening with edible plants into the chat, that would be great. It would help me to know a little bit more about my group that I'm talking to. And um, we'll go from there. So if as I'm talking, you have any questions, um, just make sure that everybody has muted themselves, please. And then if you have any questions, you can just go ahead and, and put those into the chat. Um, okay, so, all right, very good. So we're gonna get started. Oops. Now we're going to get started. All right, so I, let's see, I can say interested in native edible plants, growing wine berries, not intentionally, looking to understand more of which of my many weeds we can eat. All right, so good. We'll talk a little bit about that about those topics and um, give you some resources because we couldn't possibly cover everything that's edible in this short amount of time, but we can cover some of the basics some things to think about and um, also what, uh, what resources are out there and available for you to learn more. So, so does anybody know what this picture is on here? You can put that in the chat if you do. So the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University is a 187 acre arboretum. And of course, an arboretum is like a museum of trees. It is a collection of trees for scientific and educational purposes for research and for public enjoyment. And it is curated similarly to the way museum collections are curated. So we have records of those and we invite public to come in and learn from them. And it is also a learning a, a living laboratory and an outdoor classroom. And um, we are part of America's garden capital. So there's 36 gardens within, 36 public gardens within 30 miles of Philadelphia. And um, they make up America's garden capital. And so they each have their own story, their own um, plant collections. Some of them have art and sculpture and, uh, sorry about the noise. And some of them have good restaurants. So they're in various states of open at this point, but some of them are open. So I encourage you to go to um, what the Ambler Arboretum is still closed right now, unfortunately. Um, but you can go to americasgardencapital.org and there's, they have a, a regularly updated list of the public gardens that you can go and visit now. So they let you know if they're open and if they're open in a modified capacity, what that looks like. So I encourage you to go and check out that that website and uh, just see all the variety of gardens that are in the area. And so we also encourage you to follow if you are on Instagram or other social media channels, you can follow the hashtag our gardens your home. And a lot of us are posting to Instagram um, just to keep people connected and show them what's going on in the gardens, even though they can't be there. So I encourage you to do that. You can see these are all pictures from our public gardens in our area. We are lucky, we are so incredibly lucky to have such diversity and such horticultural wonder uh, not, not too far from us. So you can go and check that out, Our Gardens Your Home and follow America's Garden Capital. Of course, the Ambler Arboretum is part of that. And um, we have 15 named kind of teaching gardens. We have acres of meadows and woodlands in the gardens. We uh, started as the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women in 1911. And that's what this, that's now the Temple Ambler campus started out as. So it was a school specifically designed to combine um, book learning with hands-on learning. And so that continues to this day where the Arboretum still functions as a place for hands-on learning um, to reinforce the class lo classroom learning the students are um, experiencing. and. It's not just for landscape architecture and horticulture. We have painting classes that happen here. We've had the classics come in because our scientific name of plants are in Latin and Greek. So um, any courses can come in and, and use this uh, facility. We also have been recently designated a field station, a, um, a biological field station, which means uh, researchers from all across the country and the world, if they wanted to, could come and use our assets 
to, um, to, for their research purposes. So we're really excited about that as well. And the gardens, I want to remind you, especially because we've missed spring in the gardens and now we're missing summer in the gardens, is that our gardens are beautiful and there's something interesting at all times of the year. And I really encourage you to visit botanical gardens for um, inspiration and for education. So if you're looking to see what looks interesting in different times of the year or you want to add diversity to your landscape but you're not sure what to plant, going to botanical gardens are a great place to, to start. You can get inspiration there. The plants are labeled so you can figure out what it is. Um, in our case at the Ambler Arboretum, we don't fence off for deer. And so we're really trying very hard to figure out what plants do well with a, a, a concentrated deer population. So you can come and see what's surviving where we are and um, take those ideas home. So um, we also have a, a good focus on winter blooming plants and plants that are interesting from say Halloween to Easter and with that can really um, add some diversity and some interest to your landscape. So we encourage you to check it out. Uh, so this was, I'm sorry, this was our healing, this is our healing garden, our labyrinth in our healing garden, which also the labyrinth doesn't, but this garden as a whole uh, does dual purpose as a stormwater management tool. And so we also like to model how you can use plants to solve problems at, at the Arboretum, uh, environmental problems, not not all problems, you know. Um, that's why the labyrinth is there to help work through all the rest of the problems. So uh, this is our formal perennial garden. This date, dates back to the mid 1920s and um, has been in this design since then. Uh, the colors change through the seasons and the combinations and the textures change through the seasons. This is uh, the Women's National Farm and Garden Association Visitors building, visitor center. The Women's National Farm and Garden Association was founded at the um, Ambler campus, which was the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women in 1914. And um, what I love about this building is that you can see the cold frames here in the picture. We use those for display now because the greenhouse complex has moved. But um, the women of the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women, those students helped build this head house. If they needed something on this campus, they had to build it themselves. So, so they got all kinds of hands-on learning. So this is obviously a summer picture with our um, annual kind of trial display here. Um, and then fall, of course, is another good time to visit. And uh, with our tree collection, the diversity of our tree collection, the autumn colors are astounding. Here we have a uh, deciduous, this is a bald cypress, a weeping bald cypress here. And so it's just turning colors and starting to drop its leaves. And a dwarf ginkgo here also dropping its, its uh, leaves. So this is our Calabrero conifer garden, which is um, just a, it's a great place to come and visit. So we encourage you to come and visit in all seasons when you're allowed to again. We hope to have an announcement that will be opening soon. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And if you wanted to know where you keep an eye out for that, there's a couple of places. We have a brand new website. And so this is arboretum.temple.edu. And on here, you can do virtual tours, you can get on our mailing list, you can become a member, you can find out about volunteer opportunities and ways to support the Arboretum, programs that we have going on, workshops, all that kind of stuff you can find at the Arboretum website. So you can visit us there, arboretum.temple.edu. Or if you are an Instagram person, you can follow us at Ambler Arboretum uh, Temple U. And um, see what we're up to and just get shots from what's going on in the gardens at the time. So, so I encourage you to connect with us and um, find out what we're up to and join us in the gardens as soon as we're able to get back in there. So now to get to what we're here to talk about, the edible plants for the landscape. So I asked what you thought this was and I got some answers. Um, I got persimmon question mark and then a, a couple of affirmatives for persimmon. And that's true, this is a persimmon. This is our native persimmon that we can grow in our landscapes just fine around here. And I'll talk a little bit about those. And um, just one of the many edible plants that we can include in our landscape. So um, nothing in here will likely replace your uh, groceries that you have to go out and get every week or your vegetable garden. But these are ways to consider 
by planting these, you add food that you could eat, but also a lot of this is also is good for wildlife. So if you're adding to the diversity of your landscape with edibles, there's a good chance that um, your wildlife will appreciate that as well. Now, if you want to harvest it yourself, you may have to figure out ways to keep the wildlife away from your harvest. Um, that's a whole different story. But these are some plants that, that you can include. So just a disclaimer, um, eating wild plants or uh, you really want to make sure that you know exactly what this plant is, right? You want to have positive identification. You want to check and double check before you eat anything. Um, and so you just want to keep that in mind. You just want to be absolutely certain that before you eat anything wild or different or unusual, something that's outside of your comfort zone, that you have definitely positively ID'd what it is. Um, in some cases, parts of the plant are edible, but other parts are toxic. So for example, the um, black locust. So black locust grows all over around here. It's native to the Midwest. In some lists, it's considered invasive around here, but we do have it because these long strands of white pea, like pea-like flowers, you know, like uh, uh, green peas, that type of flower um, that hangs from it and they smell so good, just like honey. And you can actually harvest those and there's recipes for fritters and all kinds of things, but all the rest of the plant is toxic. So um, you really have to be careful in what you're harvesting and know exactly what parts you can harvest. So can someone, I'm not sure, can you all see me talking? Can someone put yes or no in the chat? That would be great if you can see me talking. And if you can't, okay, cool. So I'm gonna hold this up. So I have two re re uh, references for you. So this is uh, a book called Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten, and it's by Russ Cohen. And um, I'll put these up again at the end. But this is a great one if you're into wild foraging or you wanna plant natives. He talks a lot about native plants in here and how you can eat them. So milkweeds and um, all, kinds of, all kinds of things in here. And he is pretty great. His writing is good. It's really understandable. And um, so I highly recommend this book if you're into wild edibles. And so I would just look in the index and see what native plants are there. That makes a good landscape plant too. So what I focused on here was um, edible plants that would make good landscape plants. So they're not just plants that you can just walk around and find and, and eat. Um, but really that would also add to your landscape that have multiple seasons of interest and ornamental features as well as being edible. So, so yeah, I still just the disclaimer is on there. So, um, I will, I will also put the book up at the end. All right. So, so we'll start with persimmon. So persimmon is a large tree. It is a native tree and, um, it is the distinguishing characteristics on this are uh, it does tolerate a lot of conditions. It'll tolerate clayey soils and compacted soils. And um, it stays, you can see in this picture, it stays more narrow than wide. Its foliage is this deep glossy green. That's very nice. It is related to ebony and that family. And the wood here, the bark on it is dark black. And as it ages, the bark becomes very ornamental. It almost looks like charcoal briquettes stacked on top of each other. So it's super ornamental and easy to distinguish out in the field or as it, as it ages. They do sucker, so they tend to grow in clumps. Now the key with a uh, persimmon is that um, they're male and female plants. That term is dioecious. And dioecious means two houses. It means there's a male house and a female house. So all the flowers on one plant are male and all the flowers on another plant are female and you need both in order to get fruit on it. And so you have to make sure if you want to get fruit um, that you have the male and the female or there's a male somewhere in the area. They are sold gendered and so, or sexed I guess. So they are sold that way. So you should know, you should be able to tell from a nursery if you're getting a male or a female plant. And um, there are cultivars available. So if you just wanted to buy, you could buy the straight species of native plant, of this native plant, or you could buy cultivars of this that have been bred for better fruit set or better fruit taste. And so these persimmons, you can see this has 
so many persimmons on it, right? Um, so these, these plants do get a ton of persimmons on them. And really, you're not going to be eating these until um, probably after Thanksgiving uh, is when they usually are tasty. Um, so you can see the size of them. So if you're thinking of like an Asian persimmon that you might see in the grocery store, these are much smaller. So these are like, um, I want to say like ping pong ball size. And um, the key to these is that you have to uh, wait for them to go through a freeze and a thaw, uh, a, a deep, a, a hard frost before you try to eat them. If you try to eat them picked from the tree, when they kind of look this pristine, like a pristine orange uh, ping pong ball, when you bite into it, it's very astringent. It almost, it, it feels like it sucks all the moisture out of your face, uh, like you're chewing on chalk. And I have learned from experience that this is not the way to introduce people to wild foods or new foods, especially at Thanksgiving when you bring a whole bucket of them with you from this tree, because look how many there are, and they're all not exactly ripe. So the uglier it is and the squishier it is and the wrinklier, more wrinkly it is, that is when it starts to be really tasty. Um, and even the drops on the ground, sometimes those can be the best tasting ones. So you want to be aware when you're, when you're going to grow plants to eat that are new to you, that you um, understand the harvesting and the timing of this. So um, this plant, this, this one here, this is at, it's funny, it's right along a parking lot at, at a liquor store in South Jersey. Uh, right sort of as you cross over the bridge into South Jersey towards um, like really South Jersey, Atlantic County way. Um, there's a liquor store and this was in the parking lot. I don't know where the mail is, but this thing just goes crazy with fruit every year. And so, um, you know, if you're ever driving to the shore in the fall and you see some crazy person in a liquor store parking lot picking up fruits off the ground, you know who it might be. Uh, so persimmons. Right, so uh, so big, they can be a shade tree. So you can think of this in your landscape as a shade tree. And when you're thinking of your landscape or, or gardening um, in a way that supports not only you and your aesthetics, but also the wildlife around you and the ecology of your area, you wanna think in layers. So this would be a canopy layer. And our a healthy system has four layers. It has the canopy, it has the understory, it has the shrub layer, and then it has the ground cover herbaceous layer. And so we're gonna talk about some trees and shrubs so you can get that layers of diversity into your landscape. So next one, Asimina triloba, the pawpaw. So uh, let's see, if you have had a pawpaw, um, let's see, can you raise your hand if you had a pawpaw before, if you've eaten a pawpaw? You should be able to go under participants and you should be able to select raise hand. So if you just click on that participants, um, or you can just put it in the chat if you've had a pawpaw. But pawpaws are very popular. They are perfectly hardy here. They are the United States or the um, North America's largest native edible fruit. And um, I think the contiguous United States. And they are a um, hardy member of what is normally a tropical uh, family of plants. So same is true for the um, persimmon. So that's, they're kind of a weird outlier where they're hardy here, where all of their other relatives are in tropical areas. And this is true for pawpaw. Pawpaw is also considered an ecological anomaly uh, because there's not much around that eats them. They evolved most likely with um, large megafauna before the ice age. So giant sloths and um, that kind of thing would go and eat them. That's why the fruits are so large. And they've hung around and moved around mostly by humans. The seeds are so big that not much of our small wildlife can move them around. Although they will get eaten by raccoons on occasion. But so the pawpaws themselves, you can see here, they're about the size of a mango. And people describe the taste as a cross between, it's a custardy texture on the inside, and it's a cross between a banana and a mango flavor. So if you can imagine sort of eating a banana mango custard, that's kind of what it tastes like. 
the land, the plant itself. So these aren't ripe yet. These ripen about mid September is when they're ripe. They don't transport well. They don't store well. They bruise really easily and they don't really ripen once they're off of the tree. And so for all of these reasons, you don't find them in commerce. You, I've never seen one at farmer's markets for sale. Maybe you all have, but, um, but generally you just have to know the spot. They do grow wild, especially in the Susquehanna River Valley. You can kind of hike around in parks and find um, colonies of pawpaws. They sucker and they form these colonies is how they grow. And they will do that in your landscape too. Just be aware, they will form a colony. So you either have to cut back the suckers or uh, just give it room to roam. Depends on what kind of space you have. What I really like about these is they're deer resistant. The deer don't bother these trees at all. They'll be branched all the way to the ground and the deer won't bother them. If you were to break a leaf of this pawpaw and have to have very large leaves, kind of tropical looking. And if you were to kind of crunch a leaf up or break it up, you would, you would, t I would smell this odor. It's almost, um, chemically or, or um, petroleum in nature, this odor. It's very off-putting to the deer, those oils that are in it, just deer don't prefer it and so they don't bite it. But what I like about it, it's a nice size 25 foot tall, kind of uh, understory tree. It does get, it does sucker, the deer don't eat it, has this tropical looking foliage, which adds a nice texture to your landscape and um, is often multi-stemmed and uh, has this great yellow fall color. So in addition to being able to eat the fruit, it has all these ornamental characteristics too. Before the leaves come out, before the fruit sets, they have these great maroon three-petaled flowers that are out on the branches, just hanging out all by themselves. And because they're maroon, they're hard to notice in the landscape, they sort of disappear. But if you get up close, they're really fascinating. They're pollinated by flies and beetles because they don't smell good either, those flowers. But the fruit, people say, is delicious. I have to say, if you have an opportunity to try pawpaws, and someday when we're back at the Arboretum, we do harvest from our pawpaw patch and we offer tastings. So we'll have to let people know when that's going on, when we can ever do that again. But, um, but you should try them. Some people love them and some people don't like them at all. To me, it, I've never met somebody who said they're okay. They either love them or they really dislike them. Um, and uh, the seeds are enormous and you, they grow very easily. One of the keys with getting pawpaw fruits though, is that you, it needs um, genetic diversity to set fruit. So in order for those flowers to pollinate, you have to have um, plants from different genetics. So I caution anybody who buys plants, you need two of them, but you maybe don't wanna get two from the same place unless they can tell you with um, absolutely that they're from different genetics. Because what some people will do is just dig up some of those suckers and give them away or sell them. But those are genetically identical plants because they're from the same parent. And you actually need seedlings. So you need those that have grown um, from different plants. Or you can get nursery grown cultivars that are different. So the reason for that is they just won't, they're not self fertile, they won't pollinate themselves. And that's why you can go along the Susquehanna or along the um, Potomac down in Maryland you can walk along there and you could be in a colony full, like acres of pawpaw. You know, there's songs about pawpaw patches and all that, just, you can find endless pawpaws, uh, plants, but hardly any fruit. And that's because they're, it's a clone, it's, it's clonal and they're all related. So um, fertilization of the flowers, pollination is rare. So you really need that genetic diversity in order to get your fruit on these. So you need two pawpaws. And what I would recommend is just getting them from different places or growing your own from seed. And then you're sure to get pawpaws, uh, pawpaw fruit. And all of these are uh, relatively easily, readily available. It might be at a specialty uh, native plant nursery or um, not generally sort of big box stores wouldn't have a lot of these, but, uh, but your native plant nurseries will have these uh, available. A lot of them will. So uh, especially now they're becoming more and more popular. So blueberries are a pretty good go-to for, uh, or actually they're a go-to that a lot of people want to incorporate into their gardens. Uh, they're familiar fruit. People love blueberries and they want to have them themselves. They are a little problematic though, or challenging 
because, um, because they have very specific requirements that our area doesn't fulfill. And that is uh, well-drained soil and very uh, acidic soil. So most plants grow very well in a soil that is um, somewhere around neutral, usually between six and 6.5 the most nutrients are available to a plant in that pH of the soil. And blueberries don't wanna be higher than 5.5 pH, which is very acidic. If you think about uh, the pH scale, those differences are exponential. They are, so, so a jump from 5.5 to 6.5 is dramatic when it comes to um, growing plants. So if you wanna grow blueberries, which are great, they have white flowers in the spring, red leaves in the fall, blueberries are like the all-american shrub the red white and blue and of course they have these edible berries so if you want to grow them uh, you really should create a bed specifically for them and amend that soil to grow them you can so i have blueberries in my backyard i just planted them i didn't amend the soil at all they look fine they're green they're doing okay um, but they don't get they get maybe one flower and one blueberry because the soil is bad for them. So I should really move them and put them in a place where I can amend the soil so you can reduce the acidity of your soil um, by adding sulfur and uh, then plant them in there. And you'll have a much better chance of actually getting fruit on these. They are ornamental plants anyway, but if the purpose is to eat them, I just thought I'd mention them because so many people want to grow them and are familiar with them, but they are a challenge. So if you're not getting a good blueberry crop, you should check the pH of, your, uh, of the bed you're planting them in. And so there are a couple of species types of blueberries. There's high bush blueberries and low bush blueberries. High bush blueberries are just that, so they can get eight, 10, 12 feet tall. Low bush blueberries only get uh, at the most two feet tall. They can get equal sized berries on them. The wild blueberries that are really tiny are kind of native to more northern areas and a different species. And then you can get hybrids. And so the hybrids are usually a hybrid of the high bush blueberry. And you can buy these named varieties and all of them are fine. They all need that pH requirement. So you have to um, be careful and uh, do your best for those plants to, to amend that soil. You can see my hand is just completely blue. I picked, I don't know, 20 pounds of blueberries that day or something. So um, one of my favorite edibles I just love is the, um, this is American plum. So this is Prunus Americana. So if you like flowering cherries or if you like the early spring blooms that um, you know cherry blossoms show you, this might be a plant for you to consider. This is a native, it also does send up suckers but the, these are the flowers in the spring, uh, early spring, so earlier than a lot of the other flowering cherries, they, uh, it does bloom uh, and it smells like honey when it blooms. It's just so fragrant. It's incredible. And then it gets these kind of, um, I want to say like nickel or quarter sized plums on them. If it gets pollinated well enough, you'll start getting these plums, which are really delicious. They're small, but they taste like a plum and they're really good. So you have this beautiful spring display here that you can see the spring display. And then in the summer or the, uh, yeah, late summer, late spring, early summer, you start to get these fruits on them. And so pollination though is key. You definitely need another plant. Uh, you need two of these for it to set good fruit. And so in this picture you see here, I have uh, this baby plum here that I actually like picked up and then danced around this one. So the pollen could go from this one to onto this one to, to help pollinate the flowers. So I would get a good fruit set because I didn't have another pollinating tree around for it. And it worked really well. So you get these, these great plums for it. And those beautiful, uh, the beautiful flowers. And then it gets a like kind of a yellowish fall color. So you have those, it will send up suckers all along, all around here, it'll start to send up suckers. So you have to watch out for those and just keep them in check. In the wild, this will form a thicket and um, it will pollinate itself even in that thicket and then get filled with fruit. A relative of this one, so this one only gets about 20 feet tall. It's relatively small. Uh, it can be called a large shrub or a small tree. Mostly you see them as trees. 
So a relative of this that's smaller is the uh, beach plum. And so this is native if you go to the shore um, and if, if you go to Island Beach State Park, you might be familiar with their beach plum festival. And uh, so beach plums are shrubby flowering plums. And so again, spring blooms that smell really good. But in this case, you can see the habit of it is much more like a shrub. So it'll get still get about eight feet tall, but it has this kind of shrub. You can keep it pruned back. But after it's finished blooming, the blooms are followed by these fruits, which are, um, I want to say grape, large grape sized. And uh, they have a, a good size pit in them, but again, they're delicious. So at the Beach Plum Festival, you can learn all about beach plums. You can buy beach plum jam and jelly and all of that, but they're good. They're delicious right from the um, shrub as well. This is an interesting plant because it does grow in uh, sand dunes. It is on the coastal plain. It really likes that well-drained soil, poor nutrients. That's where it thrives. In our gardens, they, we tend to have too rich of a soil for it. It uh, has too many nutrients and it's, not, it's getting too much water. And so they do tend to be leggy and not produce as much fruit, but they will still flower and they will produce some fruit. Uh, at, in the shore, at the shore, the, the conditions they grow in keep them in check. So it keeps them smaller, more compact. You can expect them to grow bigger and kind of leggier and more open in our garden soils. So they can kind of look a little rangy. So you might want to prune for that or uh, plan to mix them in with other plantings that'll hide that, uh, maybe a mixed hedge of edibles or, or something like that. But they are delicious. Quince is not a native, but um, it is an old fashioned plant that you see around. And um, so Canomalia speciosa, you can buy flowering quince. You just wanna be sure if you buy flowering quince that it is the type that will fruit. Some quince have been bred just to be ornamental and it's rare that they will set fruit at all. Um, and so quince flowers flower super early in the spring. They're, one of, they're an early shrub to bloom. They bloom, bloom around the same time as forsythia. And they're upright, they can get eight feet tall. They're, uh, they have um, very dense, lots of twigs, many branches close together, uh, many trunks close together at the base, and they do have thorns. They have beautiful flowers that you can cut the branches early in the spring or late winter and bring them in and force them to open, and so you have fresh flowers in the winter. But um, if they set fruit, if the ones you have set fruit, which you want to focus on this Canomaly speciosa, uh, you can see this looks like an apple, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quince, looks just like an apple. They're related, they're in the same family, they have the same kind of star shape at the bottom, but they're a little more tart. And so this is, um, this is the fruit you could get from them. So that is um, an advantage, you know, quince jams, quince jellies, all of that stuff you can make from them. Most people don't eat them fresh, but turn them into fruit so you can get that. So another rule of thumb, if you wanna garden for edibles is that if you have options of plants, some have been bred just to be ornamental. Like there's ornamental pears, ornamental apples, ornamental cherries, or you could grow the edible ones, get the flowering and the fruiting. So you can consider that when you're thinking of your landscape. You say you want a flowering cherry, like, well, what about, you know, the fruiting cherries flower also, and they're gorgeous flowers. So you could, you could have that as the edible in your landscape. Now this one tends to elicit groans from my audiences whenever I talk about it. And this is black walnut, the Juglans nigra. So black walnuts are native to here. They're part of our ecosystem and they support a lot of wildlife. And a lot of people don't like them because they have a chemical in them called juglone, which um, is, in all, in, is found in all parts of the plant and is a naturally occurring growth inhibitor, which means that certain plants that are sensitive to this chemical will not grow around this plant, around these black walnut trees. And in some cases around here, we have groves of black walnut trees. They've just formed thickets. There's, there are native plants, there are plenty of native plants that will do fine and grow under black walnut. There's no reason to cut them down or think that plants won't grow under them. Plants that we tend to like to grow in our gardens, like rhododendrons, azaleas, tomatoes, and eggplants are very sensitive to the juglone and will not grow at all. The, the trees will kill those plants if you um, planted under the walnut. 
but there's a ton of plants that'll do just fine. But the black walnuts, if you're lucky enough to have them in your yard or know where they are, are edible. They are a little tougher to get into than the English walnuts. So it's English walnuts that we usually buy from the store and eat, but um, black walnuts are perfectly edible. And so Russ Cohen, the author I was telling you about, the way he recommended um, uh, harvesting these is sort of going around and getting them in this stage when they kind of, they're, uh, they're, this one was the biggest walnut I've ever seen. But um, so they're in this green stage. So this is the husk and they have this green shell on them. So you collect them at that time and then you just sort of pile them up and let them go through the winter and just soften that husk up. And then this is what um, you end up with uh, inside the husk. And then the nut is inside here. And another friend of mine who does a lot of wild edibles and, and foraging, she puts them in a plastic bag and runs them over with her car. And that's how she gets the husks off of her um, or gets the shells off of the nuts. And because these stain, they'll turn your hands black uh, just by getting them off of there. So if you can figure out a mechanical way to do it that doesn't involve your hands or just use gloves, you wanna make sure you do that because that, st that stain takes forever to come out. And if you get it in your clothes or something, it doesn't come out. And it was actually used by Native Americans for those purposes. So, um, so you have this, the, the black walnut. So there's a couple of ways. So you can use this just as you would use walnuts. It has a little more bitter taste. You can actually buy black walnuts in grocery stores, uh, black walnut pieces. It's a little more strong of a walnut taste than the English walnuts are. Those are kind of mild. And um, so I've had um, black walnut baklava, which was delicious. So I highly recommend that recipe. And uh, so you can see here the nut on the tree is compound leaf, very distinctive bark on walnuts, thick blocky bark. And um, you all probably know walnuts. They, um, they, they do tend to grow in colonies. People in Pennsylvania have bought property and planted walnuts as their retirement plan because the wood is so valuable. Walnut is made into um, furniture and it is very valued as, as a timber. And, and so, um, so there's that benefit of it too. And finally, we at the Arboretum, and I hope you'll be able to join us in March when we do this again, we do a tapping program where we talk about all the different types of trees you can tap for sap to make syrup out of. And black walnut is one of those. You can actually tap black walnut trees, harvest the sap, sap boil it down the same way you boil down maple sap, and make syrup out of it, and it's delicious. So it's just another way that you can eat this plant. So since we're talking about sap, we should talk about the sugar maple. And the sugar maple, Acer Sicarum, um, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Carrie attended that program, so that's exciting. <laughs> so the sugar maple is another one that um, you can, of course, tap for the sap. That's what it's most famous for. You boil it down, you make syrup. It also is a good landscape plant. The uh, black walnut, I have to say, mostly people aren't planting these for ornamental value. They are the last ones to get their leaves in the spring. They're the first one to lose their leaves in the fall. They get an okay yellow color. The nuts fall down all over the place and cause problems mowing the grass and all of that. Um, they have the, the growth inhibitor on them. So people tend not to choose to plant them. In fact, it's hard to even find them for sale. But if you happen to have them around or know where they are, you can certainly take advantage of it. They're not, they're not all bad. I like them a lot. They're not all bad. Um, so sugar maple, Acer sicarum, again, you can tap these for sap. Generally, the rule of thumb is a tree must be 10 inches around before you start to tap it for its sap. That way there's enough sap to support the tree also. But good landscape characteristics for this. Um, tolerant of a, a variety of conditions, great fall color, good um, spring. In early spring, it's one of the earliest trees to flower. We don't often think of maples as flowering trees, but they are. And um, But the only word of caution with these is if you are buying these, you want to buy ones that were grown farther south. They are struggling with our warming climate, and um, they're naturally migrating up to the north and west in Canada uh, to get to the colder spots is where they prefer to be. So our warming here is not helping them and they're struggling in a lot of cases in this area because of our warming climate. 
and the crazy storms and, and all of that. So if you do want to plant sugar maples to harvest syrup, you want to proceed with caution and then see if you can find ones that were grown farther south, they're more acclimated to our warming climate. So uh, another non-native, Coosa dogwoods. So you may know Coosa dogwoods. They're the, the dogwoods that bloom with the leaves later than our native flowering dogwoods do. They bloom with the leaves um, and they're star-shaped. They're, they're, the petals on there are very pointy instead of being rounded like a, our native dogwood. So Coosa dogwoods were brought to the U.S. And um, well, I, I, so there's a theory that these brought to the U, when these were brought to the U.S., there was a disease that came with them called anthracnose. Now, now uh, that was sort of benign on these plants, but then really caused problems with our native dogwoods. The other problem, the challenge with our native dogwoods is a lot of people want to plant them in their yards, in the sun, in the grass, in the front yard. And that's exactly where a dogwood does not want to be. A flowering dogwood wants to be on the edges of woods, in the woods. It's an understory tree. It wants rich soil and shade. It does not want a front yard. So the Coosa dogwood is a good alternative for the flowering dogwood if you want a white flowering tree in your front yard, in the grass, in the sun. Um, the other dogwoods, the flowering dogwoods, the natives just get stressed out, which may, leads them susceptible to the disease, anthracnose, to dogwood borers and all the other pests. So, so you want to make sure right plant, right place. But the fruits on the Coosa dogwood, both of them get fruits. Dogwood gets tiny little red fruits. The Coosa dogwoods get these big, um, I think of them as, cap, you know, Captain Crunch with the crunch berries. They're kind of like giant crunch berries. And they are perfectly edible, the fruit is what is edible on these. So you have to make sure they're ripe, um, but they're edible. You can go ahead. The texture's strange. Um, and you know, there's a difference between delicious and edible. They're not always aligned, right? Just because you can eat something doesn't mean that it tastes good or that you're going to want to, but people do enjoy these, uh, the kusa fruits. So just another thing to think about, even if you already have that in your yard, you can go and try that out. So elderberry, uh, another native, although there are non-native el elderberries also, Sambucus canadensis is, um, so people actually take the whole flower head here. They'll cut this off and they'll put it in a very light batter and fry them up for elderberry fritters. So you can eat the flowers that way. And then if you don't cut the flowers off, you can get the fruits afterwards. Now these are very astringent and tend to need to be processed. You're not going to just harvest these right off of the shrub and pop them into your mouth. Um, be a similar experience to eating an unripe persimmon. But you can process them. So you see a lot of elderberry wine and elderberry jam that happens with these, but they are, um, they are perfectly edible. And I know just from watching my chickens that the chickens love to eat them right off of the plant, which is hilarious to watch. So this is a native shrub suckering, tends to like wetter areas. Uh, full sun is fine, part shade is fine. Um, it gets about six feet tall. And normally I would say the deer don't bother it, but the deer decimated the one in my yard and I'm not sure what's going on with that. So, um, so proceed with caution if you have deer in those. Service berry. Uh, so there's a number of different service berry species. This is Amelanchia. SPP just means um, species plural. And so they're called service berry or shad blow or June berry. And June berry because that's when they get their berries is in June. Shad blow because their flowers lose their petals and the petals start to blow away when the shads start running in the rivers around here. Or service berry which has to do with um, either weddings or funerals and the thawing of soil um, depending on the folklore that you hear about this plant. But these are, the birds love them, but these are perfectly edible. You can harvest these right off of the plant and eat them right from the plant. Wow, I blew up these pictures and I'm sorry that the, these two are so blurry. But here you have, so these are the white flowers in the spring, smooth, relatively smooth gray bark. These tend to be upright and vase shaped. So, and they get a wonderful fall color. The fall color is just purples and oranges and yellows and they're really terrific and I recommend I recommend this plant to people who um, maybe have calorie pear or Bradford pears and know that they're invasive and want to get rid of them or the calorie pear or Bradford pear exploded in the last storm and now they need to replace it. This is a great 
white spring flowering tree. It doesn't have the problems that Bradford pears do. And it is uh, native and it has those edible fruits. So it's got multiple seasons of interest. So I highly recommend this as a, a, a spring flowering tree for your yard. Tolerates a lot of, of conditions. And there are some hybrids out there that were bred for better fruit or for better fall colors. So you can go and, and check that out, but the fruits are edible. Spicebush, Lindera benzoin. This is a, um, a native, you can find this around in our woods. It's sort of like our native forsythia. It blooms before forsythia. Before anything else has leafed out or started flowering, you'll see a haze of yellow forming in our woods in the understory. And that is probably our spice bush that you're looking at. The deer don't tend to eat it because it is high in oils. That makes the entire um, plant fragrant when you scratch it, uh, scratch the bark off, it's very fragrant. So you see here the flowers in early spring before anything else comes out. And then those are followed by fruit. Again, these are male and female plants. So you need both to get these fruits. I haven't seen a place that sells the, um, these plants as male or female. So I just haven't found that yet. But chances are you, if you have a female plant, you will, there's enough in the area that it'll get pollinated and you'll end up with these fruits. And if um, you, so that's why you also wanna buy a few of them to, to make sure that you have a female, at least one female so that you can um, harvest these fruits. These fruits are loved by the birds also, but um, some people say they taste like allspice and then other people say they taste more like Szechuan, like a spicy kind of spice, but you can dry them and crush them and use them in baking and for flavoring, just like you uh, would something like allspice. So um, this is also the host plant for spice bush swallowtail butterflies. So without this plant, we don't have um, spice bush swallowtail butterflies, which feed on the leaves. So sassafras is another edible. So I grew up in the Pine Barrens of South Jersey and uh, I grew up with people who cr made sassafras tea from the roots and the, and the, the bark of sassafras. And um, a, uh, there was a report that came out from the, I don't know if it was the CDC or who was doing the research on it, that the chemical in sassafras that kind of gives it its distinct fragrance is um, toxic or can't, has the potential for causing cancer. And so people stopped using sassafras for sassafras tea, or people were supposed to stop. And I know in the Pine Barrens, it still goes on, but, um, but they recommended that you stop using it. I don't know how many follow-up uh, research has been done on that, but, but I put it in here because also it is this, the, the young leaves, so the early spring leaves before, um, before they harden off while they're still soft and small, the, those leaves are actually what are harvested and dried and ground up and made into filet, which is the, um, I wanna say spice that's used in, um, in Cajun cooking, in gumbo as a thickener, it's filet and it's sassafras leaves. So those leaves when they're young do not have that chemical in them yet. And so they are, um, they're okay to use. So these, these are the fruits of sassafras. So again, male and female plants on the female plants, they get these great hot pink stems with these navy blue fruits on them. The birds love to eat them. I wouldn't call them edible for us, but you could harvest the leaves and use those. So the other day I was, I was walking my new walking route around the neighborhood and uh, came across this plant. And I was very excited because I hadn't, I've noticed so much on my walking around the neighborhood um, that I have never noticed before in all of these months of exploring and looking at things much more closely. But I found this is um, Corylus americana. This is a native hazelnut. Oh, usually they just have one N on them. Sorry about that. So the native hazelnuts are, you know, the hazelnuts that come in a mixed um, bag of nuts. So those are usually bigger. Those, those are European hazelnuts. And here we do have American hazelnuts. So you can grow these, you can buy these for sale, you can incorporate them into your yard. They get about six to 10 feet tall and they are a suckering shrub. They get a nice yellow fall color. They have catkins like birch do. They have these long catkin flowers and um, then they form these crazy looking fruits. 
So um, these are modified leaves here, and then inside is a hazelnut. So these will turn brown when they're ripe, and then you can just sort of peel those um, modified bracts off, and then you have a hazelnut to eat under there. So you're not just limited to berries, right? You can eat these nuts also. You have to beat the squirrels to these, but but they are they are edible. You can toast them and uh, and eat them. So you can you can buy those. You can buy the European ones too if you wanted to. So sumacs often get a bad rap also because people know about poison sumac and associate our um, our uh, native sumac shrubs with uh, poison sumac. These are not poison. So um, a number of sumacs are great landscape plants. Good fall color, will grow in any conditions. They do tend to sucker, add a really kind of tropical texture to it, and also are great for wildlife. And in this case, what's edible are these um, bobs here we call them, or um, it's basically the fruit cluster. So all these are individual little fruits. And probably you want to, wouldn't want to eat these individually, but what the Native Americans used to do and people still do today is you take this and you soak it in uh, ice cold water and it imparts this sort of citrusy taste to it. It's almost like a, a lemonade flavor to the water and then you can drink that. And so, um, so that's kind of exciting to do uh, if you wanted to and have a great plant while you're at it. So you could do that with wing sumac, staghorn sumac, or um, smooth sumac. They'll all work for that. Of course, there are um, all kinds of native blackberries and raspberries that are perfectly edible. All the rubus, all the rubus you can find, so rubus is the genus name for blackberries and raspberries, are edible. And of course, positive ID is key, but any rubus you can find is edible. And that includes wine berries. So somebody had asked about wine berries. So wine berries are edible also. They're um, coming into being edible now and are edible. I think the ones around me are edible now. And so they're kind of short and flattened, bright red. And the way you tell wine berry from all the other raspberries and blackberries that we have, and there's quite a few that are native to this area, you can grow them or you can just find them growing wild, is that the wine berries have hairs all along their stems, red hairs. And so it makes the stem look purple and, and has hairs. The leaves have hairs on them. The fruit have hairs on them. The um, petals on the, behind, the backs of the flowers, the sepals have hairs on them. So they're very hairy. None of our native raspberries and blackberries have those hairs on them. So if you're wondering if you're picking a wine berry or if you're picking a blackberry or a raspberry, uh, those wine berries have those hairs. Our natives, so this I picked, this is a handful of blackberries I picked along the Perkyoman Trail um, in, I don't know what town, maybe near Collegeville, some Spring Mount. And uh, so they're just growing wild, no hairs on these stems, no, no hairs on the leaves or anything. But anything that's in this rubus, you can, you can har harvest and eat. You just want to make sure that you've, um, you've positively identified it. So just for some herbaceous things, oh, some, somebody just ate some this morning, great. So um, violets, the leaves, young leaves before the plants have flowered are edible and the flowers themselves are edible. In old fashioned recipes, you've seen um, jelly made out of them or they've been candied or you can use them fresh to decorate um, cakes and salads and things like that. So you can eat violets. We should talk a little bit just quickly about um, ethics of harvesting, of wild harvesting. So you want to make sure that you leave enough for the wildlife. Um, you don't want to harvest everything. You want to make sure that the plant can reproduce and go to seed so that it can sustain. For example, uh, violets are the host plant for the fritillary butterflies. And so if we ate all the violets, then we wouldn't have any fritillary butterflies. So we want to make sure that we're being ethical in this. Now, some of you might say, well, there's a million violets around and that is true, wherever you look, there looks like there's a million violets around, but you still wanna think ethically when you're harvesting this. So, so you, there are a ton of resources out there for wild edibles and eating the weeds. If you go, there's an eattheweeds.org, which kind of leads you through plants like this that are considered weeds that are completely edible. So many plants that we have that we consider weeds were brought here as food or medicine as vegetables, as, as, what we, as what the colonists or whoever introduced it here were going to eat. And then they escaped cultivation and have become weeds in our landscape. So a lot of our familiar 
garden weeds or lawn weeds actually came here as vegetables. Purslane is a weed, but is perfectly edible. Um, you know, and so here's garlic mustard and you know, there's the whole philosophy. If you can't beat them, eat them. Garlic mustard, not in this stage. You want to get garlic mustard before it goes to flower because the leaves get bitter. But if you get it before it goes to flower, you can pick the whole rosette of leaves and saute it. Or um, a lot of people make pesto out of the leaves um, using olive oil and, and some kind of nut and some Parmesan cheese. And you just blend it all together and it makes a really delicious pesto because it already has that garlic flavor in it. And um, so you can you can eat the weeds. Another example of that, of course, is our dandelions. So dandelions were brought here. Um, so dandelions were brought here as food and medicine. They have enough vitamin C in the leaves to prevent scurvy on the boats when people were coming over to this country. And you can fry the flowers as fritters. You can eat the leaves in salad. You can make them into dandelion wine. And dandelion, the local brewery by me makes a dandelion beer, which is amazing. So um, yeah, so you can use them for all sorts of purposes. So it's important, So you can, and this you can pretty easily identify. So the other thing you wanna think about when you're harvesting is how was this plant treated? Where is it located? What might've happened to it? Generally, you don't wanna pick plants right along a sidewalk or near a dog park or something like that. You wanna know what happened to it, but there's all kinds of plants out there that, that that you can eat that that maybe um you know are overlooked as as potential even even if it's not going to make your meal or or cut your grocery bill it's at least adding some diversity to your landscape and to your table and just something new and different to try so with that um there was a question about what plant was left to the left of the violet and that looks like a little sedum growing there to the left of the violet to me, that's what that looks like. And um, with that, I will take any other questions that you might have, and I'm going to stop sharing so that I can just show you this, this book again um, as a resource. So this is The Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten, so by Russ Cohen. And so really great book. I also like, he has recipes in here. So I've eaten, I had him present for me in the past and I, that's where I had the black walnut baklava from. I had, um, he made um, autumn olive, so invasive plant. Autumn olive has the red sparkly berries in the fall. You can harvest those and make a fruit leather out of them. That's so good. And um, barberry, if you have the invasive barberry or barberries in your landscape and they get the little red fruits, those are edible and they're actually sold in stores, dried barberry. Uh, as a spice. So, so what I like about this book is it comes with recipes as well as information about the plants that are edible. And then if you're interested in just diversifying the type of foods that you can have in your garden, there's this great book too called Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden by Lee Reich. And he's kind of the guru of weird fruits. And so he goes through all kinds of different fruits, more um, relatives of our like cherries and plums and apples and things like that gooseberries and currants and those kinds of things. So if you wanted more information on what you could grow and how to grow them and the weird things that you maybe never thought about, this is an excellent resource too. Eat the Weeds is a great website for, uh, for figuring out wild foraging. Um, there is sometimes questions about mushrooms and eating mushrooms. And for that, I usually direct people. There is a Philadelphia Mycological Society um, and an Eastern PA mushroomers. So you want to go to them. Those, that's where the experts are and they can teach you how to identify things. But we will never, uh, it's hard, the differences are so minor and the, um, the risk is, changes so much with those tiny differences that you don't want to identify anything over the phone. You really want to be sure of what you're eating or what you're looking at before you try to eat anything. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. And thank you so much again for joining me here. And hopefully uh, you can, we usually do an edible walk at the Arboretum pointing out all these plants and uh, taking a look at them and talking about them in person. And so I hope someday you will join us at the Arboretum for our walks and talks and um, you know, get, in, get involved and come, in, and come and visit us when we're, when we're open again. So. I am not seeing any questions. 
Well, thank you everybody very much. I hope someday to see your faces and hear your voices. <laughs>